Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, the memory verse. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. And I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Now, this is the first sermon on a Sunday where I'm branching off a little bit more. Now, of course, as you guys know, I'm preaching through our statement of faith. Okay? I'm preaching through our statement of faith. Today, I'm preaching against abortion, okay? But just to run through some of, the, some of the previous sermons that I've preached on Sunday morning, the first one, well, the first one were the church goals. That's not really encountered. But straight after that, we preached on the King James Bible. You remember that? Being our final authority. So I thought that was important to cover that first and foremost because all our truth, everything that we believe, everything we practice ought to come from the Bible, okay? But the next seven things were very important to teach because it revolves around salvation, Okay, and misconceptions of salvation. So number one was salvation by grace through faith. Okay, so salvation's not of works, it's by grace through faith. That was sermon number one on salvation. Number two was on biblical repentance. Okay, understanding how repentance fits in with salvation. Number three was about eternal security of the believer. Okay, because some people teach, well, you still got to work your way to maintain that salvation. Uh, number four uh, and number five, well, number four was about the Trinity. And number five was about Jesus Christ being 100% God and a 100% man because there are those cults out there that deny the deity of Christ. So those two topics were important. Understanding the Trinity and understanding that Jesus Christ is 100% man and 100% God. Um, of course, God said, I mean, sorry, Jesus said, uh, what did he say? <laughs> I'm paraphrasing here that if you don't believe that I am he, referring to God, then you, sh you will die in your sins. You're still yet in your sins. So that's why important, it's important to understand that Christ is, still, is God when you're receiving the gospel. Uh, number, number six was about uh, hell. Okay, Because obviously we go out and we're teaching people, hey, you're being saved from hell. You're being saved from your sins, which is the ultimate destination of hell. And then there was water baptism, though I preached that out of order because we had baptisms earlier. But it was about water baptism because again, you've got those that teach that baptism is a requirement of salvation. Okay, having to teach that baptism is a, a sign of someone that has already believed on Christ. So those things, okay, those things are vitally important doctrines, okay? You can see how a lot of those things also revolve around salvation. People that misunderstand those concepts are usually wrong on salvation. They're adding some type of works or some other requirement for salvation. This is the first time we kind of move away from the topic of salvation. Okay, we're going to be talking about abortion next week, God willing, on marriage. And the week after that, Lord willing, on creation. Okay, how, how old this earth is and how, this universe, how old this universe is. Now, none of these things are required for someone to, to believe to be saved. Okay, people might, get, might, might be mixed up on these doctrines, but none of those things are a requirement for salvation. Okay, so that's what I mean by we're taking a slightly different approach now with the topics that we're covering. Okay, so going into it, first thing I want you to realize, and look, even though it's not about salvation, it's vitally important. Okay, it's vitally important. And I would hate for anybody in this church to be mixed up on these, on these things. I think the Bible is crystal clear on these doctrines. But unfortunately, there are people that are Christians and even believers that are mixed up on the doctrine, especially even on the doctrine of abortion, believe it or not. I mean, I, I thought, honestly, I just thought anyone that had a fear of God, even those that are not saved, you know, believed abortion was wrong. It surprises me that there are Christians, even in the IFB movement, that believe it's okay. I don't know if you guys even think that's true, but believe it or not, there are people that believe that. But Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, God says to Jeremiah, Before I formed thee, before there was any forming of you as a person, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Okay, so... When before even the formation of that person in the womb of the, of the woman, before that, God knows who that person's going to be. God knows that person already, okay? Because God's all-knowing, of course, right? But I just want to point out that it's even before anything begins, God knew him. And before thou camest forth of the womb, I sanctified thee, okay? So he was a person before he came out of the womb as well, because there are those that teach you're not a person until you come out of the womb. And I ordain thee a prophet unto the nations. Okay, I ordain thee a prophet unto the nation. 
God knew that the plan for Jeremiah, God knew that Jeremiah was going to be a prophet even before any of this took place, even before he existed in the womb. God knew that was his will for Jeremiah. Okay? What I'm trying to point out to you is that life begins at conception. Life begins at con conception. What I mean by conception and what all dictionaries talk about as far as conception is, that's when the man's seed meets the woman's egg, right? Once those things are joined together, that is universally understood as conception. The moment the man's seed joins with the woman's egg, okay? Now, why is that important? You should say, yeah, of course. Now, look, conception basically means this. It comes from the word conceive. When you say, I've conceived, it means that egg of the woman has been fertilized by the man's seed. Now, I'm going to be very careful with the words I choose because, I, you know, I think these are important things that parents ought to teach their kids. But, I, of course, you know, I can't hide those facts. You know, those things exist and they come from the Bible. So I'll be cautious with what I say. Just, you know, parents, I believe you should be teaching your kids this, this teaching. But it comes from the word conceive. Now, why I'm telling you that is because the medical world wants to change what conception means. Okay, when a doctor or a nurse or a midwife says conception or just anyone else in those you know, fields, they don't mean conception like you mean. They don't mean conception like the dictionary means. They've changed conception to mean not just when the egg and the seed join, but when it's planted out of the uh, uterus wall once it takes that extra journey. That's what they call conception now in the medical world. Okay? And so we need to be careful when we're talking to these people, we probably need to use the word fertilization now. Okay? Because they want to change the meaning. They want to change the definitions just like the homosexuals want to change the definition of marriage. People want to change... Because here's the thing. They know they can't change the Word of God. They know they can't change the words that's in there. So what they'd rather do is change the definition that's in the Bible. And that's how they can overcome the words of God, is by changing what the definitions are. But all dictionaries at the moment currently agree that conception is when the seed meets the egg. Now, even the word conceive, that's a Latin word. Whenever you see the word con before a word, that means with. In Spanish, which is heavily influenced by Latin, when I say con, I'm saying with. If I'm saying contigo, I'm saying with you. Okay, so con in Latin is with. Okay, con, and then what's sieve? Conceive. Okay, it's like the word receive. Okay, it means to get. Okay, to get. So with, get. That's what it means. Okay, now it's not only about, you know, falling pregnant. You might say, I've conceived an idea. That's because you've got an idea. You've come up with an idea, right? I've conceived something. So, but that's what it means. It's with and it's with, it's get. Okay, now why is that important? It's because... The Bible uses these words to describe falling pregnant. So Genesis 4, 1, you don't need to turn there. I'll just read it to you. Genesis, actually turn there. Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. It's easy enough to get to the first book of the Bible. Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. Genesis 4, verse 1. This is the first time Eve, who's the first woman, the mother of all living, the first time she conceives. And look what it says here. Genesis 4, 1. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived, right? There's the conceived. And bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. So remember con means with and sieve means get. I have gotten a man from the Lord. Now I'll read to you Ecclesiastes chapter 11 verse 5. Ecclesiastes 11 verse 5 says, And thou knowest not what is the way of the Spirit, nor how the bones do grow in the womb, of her that is with child. And that's a term that you're going to find a lot more in the Bible. When it talks about a woman being pregnant, it's going to use that phrase, with child. Even so, thou knowest not the works of God who maketh all. So con, being with, with pregnancy, with child, and see, which is get, gotten a child. Okay, so you can see how that word is very specific to do with falling pregnant, with conceiving as well. Okay, so... You might say, well, Kevin, you know, that might just mean, you know, because like Genesis 4.1, when she says, I've gotten a man from the Lord, that's after the birth. And it doesn't really say here about being with child to do with, with being in the womb. Well, I mean, it has to do with being in the womb. But at what point is that exactly? 
because it says here, you know how the bones do grow in the womb. So bones develop later in the stage, not straight at conception, but they develop later. But you'll see that even uh, at the moment of conception, that the, 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 the cells that occur at that moment is considered a child according to the Bible. There is great support of that being a child. Second Samuel, you guys turn to Matthew chapter 1. You turn to Matthew chapter 1. And I'll read from 2 Samuel chapter 11. 2 Samuel chapter 11 verse 5 says, And the woman conceived, okay, there's that word conceived, and the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with child. Okay, so this is when David commits adultery with Bathsheba. The woman conceives, and what does she say? She says, I am with child. Now some people will say, well, no, it's not a child just yet. But according to what the Holy decided to capture in this story, that she was with child. Now we have further evidence of this in Matthew chapter 1 verse 21. Matthew 1 verse 21. This is about Jesus Christ. The Bible says, talking of Mary, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet. So this is a fulfillment of prophecy, okay? It was spoken of the Lord by the prophet saying, this is the prophecy, Behold, a virgin shall be with child. Remember that word, with child? Okay? She shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Okay, so this, the New Testament is quoting the Old Testament prophecy as being with child child a virgin shall be with child right now that prophecy is found in isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 i'll read it to you isaiah 7 14 this is the best passages you're going to use to teach that the moment of conception that is a living child okay isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 this is the prophecy that we just read therefore the lord himself shall give you a sign behold this is this is the prophecy behold a virgin shall Remember the New Testament, be with child? But now it says, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. So comparing scripture with scripture, comparing the Old Testament, which said the, the virgin shall conceive, the Holy Spirit saw, truth, saw, uh, saw right to translate that in the New Testament as a virgin shall be with child. So conception is with child. Don't be fooled in this, you know, by the medical system saying, well, that's not a child just yet. That's not a life just yet. That's not a human being just yet. No, according to the Bible, the moment you conceive, you are with child. Okay? Now, here's something interesting about conception. Now, people have been studying conception for a long time. Scientists have been putting, you know, just in the laboratory, which is, which is an abomination, by the way, but they've been studying and, and uh, you know, um, joining, uh, you know, male seed with a female egg and, and doing ex all kinds of experiments and, and doing, they've been doing this for decades, okay? But they're still learning new things. And look, I don't, I don't endorse the way they came up with this study, but the study is interesting anyway, okay? But only last year, on the 26th of April, 2016, so just a year ago, the Telegraph published an article on, on a scientific discovery. The, the, uh, the heading was, bright, bright flash of light marks incredible moment life begins when sperm meets the egg. So a bright flash of light makes, marks incredible moment that life begins when sperm meets the egg. And I'll just read part of the article to you. It says, human life begins, and by the way, the article recognizes that it's human life. <laughs> it's interesting, right? But human life begins in bright flash of light as a sperm meets the egg. Scientists have shown for the first time after capturing the astonishing fireworks on film, fireworks on film, an explosion of tiny sparks erupts from the egg at the exact moment of conception. Scientists had seen the phenomenon occur in other animals, but it is the first time it has been also shown to happen in humans. Not only is it an incredible spectacle, Highlighting the very moment that new life begins. Let me just, this is not the Bible. This is a secular news article. Okay, the very moment a new life begins, 
The size of the flesh can be used to determine the quality of the fertilized egg. Isn't that amazing? That this light just emulates and you know what? I mean that takes place, you know, inside you don't no one sees that. That takes place inside. But God sees fit for this light to emulate to, to shine forth the moment the sperm meets the egg, the seed meets that egg. Now you know what it reminds me of? And look, I am loose, using a loose interpretation, right? But immediately when I when I heard about this, I thought about John chapter one, verse four, talking about Jesus Christ, where it says, In him was life. And the life was the light of men. You know, in him was life and the light was the light of men. I know this has nothing to do with conception. I understand that. But it's interesting that Jesus Christ who comes and gives eternal life is considered the light of men. Okay? It's, it's, it's interesting that, you know, to receive eternal life, you must receive that light. Okay, that light being Jesus Christ to, to mankind. And I think it's just interesting and I, it wouldn't surprise me if there's, there's a coincidence to, like, you know, purpose for this directly from God, that physical life also begins with that light. Okay? So it's just an interesting thing that I thought was, you know, interesting there. But there is something special about conception. There is something special about that moment that takes place when the man's seed meets the egg, the woman's egg. So I'm preaching against abortion. Okay? And I just wanted to reinforce to you that Life begins at conception because abortion, guys, is murder. Okay, we give it these names, we call it abortion. You know, people call it abortion. That's ending the life that's in the womb. Destroying that new life in the womb of the mother. And it gets me emotional thinking about this. But what did God say to Jeremiah? I don't want to misquote it. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth of the womb, I sanctified thee. You know, life in the womb is a work of God. God is performing a miracle. The scientists don't, uh, they don't know. They don't know how it works. They don't know. And the Bible says they don't know. You don't, you don't even know where the f- bones are formed. I think that's found in Job. I think. Uh, I'm getting, I think I might be getting mixed up. But they don't even know that. They don't know how blood is formed. They don't know how bones are formed. They don't know how flesh is formed. It just happens. Those cells start to, to uh, you know, um, split and, and multiply. And before you know it, it develops everything it needs for it to be a fully functional human being. Okay? I'm not talking about life here. We know life begins at conception. But the flesh develops into this fully functional human being. That life in the womb is a baby. It's a man or a woman that God knows. God knows that person already. And abortion, such a selfish act, such a wicked act, such an evil act. I must say, people that perform this act must be reprobates. I'm not, I'm not talking about the mother, because the mother might be fooled. You know, this world is, is just corrupt in the minds of men. But I'm talking about the medical practitioners who do this, The doctors that do this day in, day out, murdering life, day in, day out. Now, I would say to you, a serial murderer is a reprobate. I'm not talking about someone that just murders someone out of rage, loses control and murders someone, okay? I'm not saying those people. I'm saying people that find pleasure in going out and just killing people one after another. They find satisfaction in that. Wouldn't you say that person is just a reprobate? Some of that God's rejected, is given a mind, a reprobate mind to. That person's not even human anymore. That person's not natural as we are anymore. That person doesn't even have a conscience anymore. How much more are these doctors that aren't killing adults, but babies in the womb, where that baby ought to be the most protected, destroying the work of God. These people... I can't believe it. We have these people treating women. <laughs> these reprobates, these murderers, these serial killers. That's what they are. That's what they are. And why do they do it? For the profit? It wouldn't surprise me if they find pleasure in it either. It wouldn't surprise me if they love destroying life. They love killing babies. And... Uh, you know, I didn't want to, want to read about the procedures. But from what I understand, they try to st- stab that brain or something, right, to kill it. 
I don't know, I don't know if they, they always get it, right? But they also try to pull apart that child, rip it from limb to limb, right? Now, you might think that all they're trying to do is destroy it, but no, 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 no. You know, recent reports in America, and it doesn't surprise me if in Australia as well, they're trying to harvest the organs. They don't want to destroy it fully. The more complete that little embryo, that little baby is, the more complete the eyes are and the brains are and the ears are and the legs, and the, the greater price they can get for it when they sell it. So not only are they making money by killing it, they're making money by selling parts of it. It's disgusting. It's wicked. It drives me crazy. I, I can't even imagine it. I can't, even, I can't imagine that there aren't more, more Christians, there aren't more churches preaching against this. It seems crazy to me. It's the Roman Catholic Church. Out of, all, out of all kind of churches that seem to be most against abortion. They're the ones that, seem that seemingly are doing the most work against it. And that saddens me that it's the Roman Catholic Church doing that, right? Now, I've been an independent Baptist for about 14, 15 years. Honestly, I can't remember a single sermon on abortion. I, I, I can't. I can't remember a sermon against it. I don't, I don't know why that is. Did I just miss it? Did I not turn up to church on that day? I don't know. But we see the importance of life in the Bible. Now, aborting a child, you know, killing a child, that's not the end of it. There are side effects for the, for the mother that goes through that. There are physical, obviously, there are physical side effects. Any kind of surgery is going to have side effects, especially this... You know that there's surgery to save your life. There's surgery to make your life better. You know, because you might be deformed or have some difficulty like that. There's, I, I understand doing that. But having surgery when you're not even sick. In fact, my wife tells me she feels healthier than ever when she's pregnant. Right? Because there's a kick, kick of hormones in the body. You know, the body's trying to look after, protect that baby. At the same time, protect that mum. You know? You know, of course, there's all those, you know, there's the morning sickness. There's all that kind of stuff that goes on with it as well. But your body's trying to look after you as much as possible, and as well as looking after that baby's life. You know, you're not even sick. You're probably at the best health in your life when you're pregnant. And they're destroying their bodies, destroying the life when they do abortion. It makes me sick. But some of the side effects are abdominal, abdominal pain and cramping. And these are, these are common side effects. These are minor, what they term minor side effects. Nausea after you do it, vomiting, diarrhea, and slight bleeding, right? Just to make it sound okay, just slight bleeding, you know? We're not even talking about the normal menstrual cycles of a woman here, just after that, that you know? But then there are the serious and physical, serious physical uh, side effects to having an abortion, which are, the, these are the ones they won't really tell you about. There's heavy and consistent bleeding. You can have infection, of course, right? You do surgery, the chance of infection is very high, you know, scarring of the uterine lining, which will cause women to not fall pregnant later should they choose to, or make it difficult for them. Damage to the cervix, damage to other internal organs, and it may even cause death. How many times do you hear about that? How many times do you hear that abortions may even cause death for the mother? Right? And sometimes people say, well, it's okay to have an abortion if it protects the life of the mother. No! It can put them to death as well. It can cause them to die as well. And, um, you know, more people... Now, I don't know if this study is right. I couldn't get enough... It's hard to get data on abortions. You know that? Even in Australia, only two states actually capture data as, as far as how many abortions take place. That's South Australia and Western Australia. So it's hard to get data. But from the, some of the things that I read is that more women die from abortion or abortion-related injuries than they do from childbirth. You know, people say, well, it's okay because, you know, the mother might die in childbirth. You're more likely to die having an abortion because childbirth is not an illness. It's natural. It's normal. The, the woman's body is made to give birth. Okay? God created the body, the, the woman's body, to be able to give birth. It's perfectly normal. It's not a sickness. But then there's not just the physical side effects to an abortion. There's the emotional side effects. These are the, again, these are the ones they don't tell you about. But these are the ones you hear constantly, women that had an abortion, that talk about, right? The regret, the anger, the guilt of killing a life, the shame. 
Why? Because, you know, while that baby's growing in, 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 in the mother, she feels a connection. She feels a connection with that. You know, for, for men, it's harder for us to feel a connection until that baby's born, right? I remember, you know, after Isabel was born, our first child, it took me two weeks, two weeks after the birth for me to feel kind of a connection, you know, like to feel love, to feel uh, protection, like pr- protecting that little one. It took me, it's like my mind hadn't switched from, you know, just being a, a single, well, no, I wasn't single, married man to being a father. It took me two weeks for my mind to go like, like you're a dad, <laughs> you know, it takes longer for a man, but a woman, immediately, she has a connection with, with that life, with that child, because it's growing in her. You know, she has a love, and that's why they feel such great shame, such great guilt when they do it. There are some other emotional uh, side effects, a sense of loneliness or isolation, a loss of self-confidence, insomnia, that's lack of sleep, they can't sleep, or nightmares, relationship issues, suicidal thoughts and feelings, eating disorders, depression and anxiety, all things that a woman will feel, side effects they feel after having an abortion. And don't tell me they don't feel this. All right? The way they market abortion, it's like it's perfectly fine. This little surgery that takes place, you're fine, you're back on your feet in a couple of days, you're back to normal. No. These are things that go on for years and years. Okay? Years and years. Destroys their life. It destroys their life. Now... Where did I, I, took, I took down, well, I'll, go to, I'll go to that later. Well, actually, no, I'll go to it now. I'll change my plan a little bit. Like I said, it's difficult to get stats on abortions in Australia. Only Western Australia and South Australia actually capture some data. So basically, taking the data from these states, um, we can extrapolate that and apply that to all the states of Australia. Now... If you take the, the data from those states and, and just apply that to the whole population of Australia, like as a percentage, it's estimated, estimated, we don't even know, we don't even know. The government doesn't even know how many babies it's killing, how many babies it's facilitating to kill. I mean, that's crazy in of itself. Can't you at least record that? Can't you at least give some respect to that life that was taken? But it's estimated that some 83,210 abortions happen per year. In Australia and that data comes from 2005 I can't find any more recent data so over 10 years ago our population has increased since then by the way and I reckon women falling pregnant and having abortions is a higher percentage than 2005 today right but let's take that data let's be conservative 83,210 abortions per year now abortion clinics are open six days of the week let's say you know, six days of the week, that breaks down. Every day an abortion clinic is open. That's 266 abortions per day. 266 babies being mass murdered in our nation today. What a sin our nation has. Now, if a normal, you know, if these clinics are open like a normal nine to five, seven and a half hours, you know, working, uh, at, you know, day, that works out to be 35 abortions per hour. So by the time I'm done preaching, if an abortion clinic was open right now, it's, it's, they're usually not on a Sunday, that's 35 babies killed at the end of my, roughly, if, if my sermon's an hour long. 35 babies in our nation, not just murdered, murdered. They must be reprobates. These doctors that do this, these medical practitioners that do this, Serial killers. Now, I don't know if you think that's bad. I think that's horrible. I think that's crazy bad. Like, that's, that's, but you know, that's not the end of the abortions in Australia. No, that's not the end. Because there are more abortions taking place than that through what they call silent abortions. Silent abortions. This is when women take contraceptive pills. Do you know what I mean by that? It means... They go out, play the whore, and I'm not excusing, I'm not excusing the men, okay? Because the men are whoremongers as well. Playing the whore, falling pregnant, and so our nation is filled with women going out there taking contraceptive pills so they would not have a baby. 
Okay, contraceptive pills. Now, there are, let me explain some of this to you, okay? There are three main types of contraceptive pills. The first one's the high dose pill. Now, this is kind of, they don't, heart, they don't use this that much anymore. But in the past, the first contraceptive pills that they were given to women, and these are basically hormones that trick a body into thinking things. But the high dose pills, the idea was to suppress ovulation. So the woman would not release the egg, okay? It would suppress ovulation. And it does this by tricking the body into thinking that it is continuously pregnant. Okay? So you're, when you take these contraceptive pills, your body thinks it's continuously pregnant for the, you know, so it doesn't release the egg. Okay? Now, that doesn't always work. Of course, these pills aren't always going to work. Right? And so women still ovulated on these pills. The second thing it does, it changes the cervical mucus in the woman. The cervical mucus is supposed to aid the seed to get to the egg, basically. Okay? But it changes the cervical mu mucus to try to prevent the man's seed from implanting itself into the egg. That's how it worked. Now, here's the thing. It didn't always work. Okay? These high-dose pills didn't always work. Okay? But there were side effects to these pills because they're high-dose. There's a high amount of um, hormones and estrogen, and it's playing up with the woman's body. Why? Because a woman is not meant to be continuously pregnant all their life, right? They're only meant to be pregnant for that nine-month period. The body takes a break, and then later on, they can fall pregnant again. But some of the side effects of this high-dose pill were blurred vision, nausea, weight gain, painful breasts, cramping, irregular menstrual bleeding, headaches, and possibly some studies linked it to breast cancer as well. And so because of the complaints, because of these side effects, and because it didn't always work, they came up with a new pill, the low-dose pill. Okay, the low-dose pill. So it's, there's less hormones, it's not as, uh, as, as pa uh, powerful and harmful to the body. Okay? But here's the thing. Because it's a low-dose pill, that means it doesn't suppress ovulation as much as the high-dose pill. It doesn't change the cervical mucus as much as the high-dose pill. Meaning that a woman was, is more likely to fall pregnant on these low-dose pills, right? Because it doesn't work as effectively as the high-dose. So they had to come up with a third thing for these pills to do. And that is to uh, create a hostile environment in the uterus so it prevents implantation. So after the seed meets the egg, it travels down the fallopian tube of the woman and it attaches to the um, heavy layer of blood of the uh, uh, uterus wall, okay? And if I've got this wrong, ladies, I apologize, you know. I'm, <laughs> you know, I, I did my best to look at this without trying to, because uh, I, I hate abortion, I don't even like looking it up, all right? But basically, it pr makes it a hostile environment, so this conceived child, this living being, cannot implant itself and it would die away because it needs to be implanted to that wall and for, th for the mother to be able to provide you know, its, it, the, the nutrients and so it can continue to develop. Okay? So this, these are silent abortions. Now, think about how many people are taking contraceptive pills. All right? So we look at abortions, we say that's disgusting. But then how many abortions are taking place? And I know there's miscarriage, I know there's natural miscarriage, but that's not done on purpose. right? That's not done on purpose. These people are taking contraceptive pills, and they might not even know this, but their medical practitioner knows that this will cause abortions. This will kill a child. So this start is not even being captured. This start is not even being captured. And then uh, the, the third pill that's common is called the mini pill. The mini pill. And this doesn't even now try to stop ovulation. Okay, because there's still side effects. People are complaining. It's causing me to do to this, to do that. All right, let's lower the dose. We'll call it the mini pill. And what that, that doesn't even prevent ovulation. So this woman, the woman's now falling pregnant as much as any other woman, but it just creates that hostile environment so that, con that uh, conce conception doesn't continue to grow. Again, makes the uterus wall hostile so it doesn't implant itself and continue to grow. All these babies in our nation, in our nation of Australia, being killed. I mean, how do you think God feels about that? It makes me sick. 
It makes me angry. It makes me hate these workers of iniquity. And I'm not even righteous as God is. How much more does this anger our God? How much more does he hate this in our nation? The founder of Planned Planned Parenthood was a woman called Margaret Sanger. Evil woman. I won't go into her right now. But I just want to give you a couple of quotes. A couple of quotes that she said. She says this about a large family. So a family like mine. The most merciful thing, she says, that a large family does to one of its infant members is to kill it. This is the founder of Planned Parenthood. Women flock to these institutions, Planned Parenthood, to get their medical help and and get their examinations done and get their abortions done and what have you. What else did she say? Look, Look, she says this. It is interesting to note, she says, that there is no hesitation to interfere with the course of nature when we desire to eliminate or prevent a a superfluity of rodents, insects, or other pests. So she's going to compare human life to insects, rodents, and other pests. But when it comes to the elimination of the immeasurably more dangerous human pest, so human life is more dangerous than rodents, more dangerous than insects and pests, She says, we blindly adhere to the inconsistent dogmatic doctrine that man has a perfect right to control all nature with the exception of himself. This is straight out against the word of God. The reason why man can control all nature is because God gave Adam dominion over all things on this earth. Did you know that? We read about that in Genesis. God gave Adam dominion over all the earth. Okay? But he never gave right for a man to take another man's life. Never. Okay? Murder is always wrong. Now, you might think, well, that's the end of the abortions, right? We have the abortions done in the clinics, and then we have the silent abortions with the contraceptive pills. That's not the end of it. (laughs) There are people, there are women that can't fall pregnant, and they probably can't fall pregnant because of all the contraceptive pills they take, right? Creates a hostile environment. And then when they want to fall pregnant, they find they can't. Because their body doesn't want to receive, right? The body doesn't want to fall pregnant anymore. It's damaging. And so what they do, they take IVF, right? IVF, in vitro fertilization. Instead of falling pregnant the natural way, instead of trusting the Lord and putting their prayers to the Lord, the world and even Christians turn to IVF to fall pregnant. Now, if you don't know what IVF is, a woman takes a hormone that stimulates egg production. So instead of releasing, you know, one egg per month roughly, on average, once they take this hormone, they release 10, 15, 20 eggs at once. Okay? Unnatural. Those eggs are then retrieved from the woman's ovaries. Okay, so you've got some electric sur- uh, surgery taking place. So you're already putting yourself in harm's way, right? So these eggs are harvested. And then the mature eggs, more, you know, it's, it's, all, it's usually more than 10. Those mature eggs are taken and implanted with the seed of man, okay, the sperm of a man. Okay, in a petri dish. In a petri, not in a woman's womb, not where it's safe and God's intention is for it to take place, but in a petri dish, that egg is forced to conceive that egg, right? To fertilize that egg, I should say. Now, what did God say? He knows them, right? We know that from the moment of conception, it's a child. And so in these petri dishes, there is life being made, okay? 10, 15, 20 new life, new babies being made in these petri dishes. Then what do they do? They find the best, the strongest, you know, the one that's going to probably you know, survive, and then they insert that back into the woman, what happens to the others? Discarded, killed. That's what happens to it. Discarded, not needed anymore. Or frozen, right? Frozen because IVF is very expensive. So if it doesn't work the first time, they try to freeze the others so the woman has other turns instead of doing that whole procedure again. Human life, frozen. And probably discarded at some point as well, right? Once, once the, they don't need it anymore, discarded. Now, why is that different to miscarriage? Because miscarriage, you lose one at a time, naturally, not intentionally. 
This is miscarriage, purposely miscarriage. This is murder. 10, 15, 20 life forms, children at once. It's wickedness. And we have Christians doing this procedure. I hope, ladies, and, you know, I think, you know, you've all had children, so we're okay. But I hope, you know, young girls, you never consider, you never consider choosing IVF if you can't fall pregnant. Okay? Every woman in the Bible that was barren, every woman that was barren was able to have a child. God was able to give them a child so trust in the Lord. Some of the women had to wait years, 20 years. But if it's the Lord's will, He'll give you that child. Pray to Him and ask Him for it. Don't take IVF, which kills children. Multiple of your children being killed. Further abortion taking place, right? Now, I'm going to try to speed, speed forward, but there are some warped teachings out there and turn to Leviticus chapter 17. Leviticus 17. There are some warped teachings out there by Christians that want to approve abortions. And they'll come up with other teachings as to when life begins. Leviticus 17 verse 11. Now, they'll basically say this. That the, 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 the cells is not a baby. The cells are not a life until it has blood. Okay, so until that baby has its own blood, that's approximately five weeks after its conception. And, uh, or when the cells attach itself to the uterus wall. That's somewhere between three to four weeks. Okay, so that, what these Christians are saying is, it's fine to have an abortion as long as there's no blood. All right? So it's fine to have these contraceptive pills because those cells are not attaching itself to the uterus wall, which is blood. Okay? It's fine to do that, they, they teach, they believe. And they take Leviticus 17, verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And that's what they use. But by the way, they misquote this. This is how they quote it. They'll say the life is in the blood. But is that what the Bible says? Does it say the life is in the blood? No, it says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it unto you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Verse 14 says, for it is the life of the flesh, the blood of it, it is for the life thereof. Therefore I said unto the children of Israel, you shall eat the blood of no manner of flesh, for the life of all flesh is the blood thereof. Whosoever eateth it shall be cut off. So they'll say the life is in the blood. What they're trying to say to you is that life equals blood. Blood equals life. That's basically what they're trying to say to you. So until there's blood, it's not a life. And until that blood comes... But what did, you, what did God say about Jeremiah? Before I formed thee, before there was any forming, he knew him. Was there a life? Yes, there was, right? But that is so ridiculous because... I'll just skip some of these things that I've got here. But, you know, a dead body, someone that dies, it still has blood. <laughs> did you know that? And that, that would still bleed for about 10 hours after death until that, that blood um, hardens and, and thickens, and then you know, it's harder for that dead body to bleed. But when a person dies, do they still have blood? Yes, they do. Does that mean they're still alive? Does it mean blood equals life? Right? Because if a dead body still had blood, that would mean it's still alive. But what does the Bible teach? It says that when the soul and the spirit depart the body, that's when there's life. I'm sorry, that's when, that's when the body dies. Right? When, when the soul and spirit depart the body. That's when it dies. It's not about the loss of blood. Now, loss of blood can cause you to die, obviously. The blood is important, right? We'll cover why that is in a minute. But some of that loses blood. Let's say they get shot, they lose a lot of blood, and they die from blood loss. Does that mean we can take that body and, and um, you know, do a blood transfusion on it, bring in new blood, fill it with blood, and it will come back to life? No. So does blood equal life in that sense? No, is this passage in Leviticus teaching that not, it's not a life till there's blood? No, it doesn't teach that, right? Because that doesn't make any sense. Also, can, and this is basically why the Jehovah Witnesses do not do blood transfusions. Because they think blood equals life. So if they put someone else's blood in their body, they think, well, what, what, who am I? <laughs> right? What is this life that's going in me? Right? And that's why they refuse it. They misunderstand this passage like other Christians do that try to support abortion. 
or at least silent abortions. But Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 says, this is when God created Adam. He says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. So God forms man. Now, I, I, I think it's perfectly reasonable to say this is a fully functional human being in the sense that it's got all its organs, all its bones. It's, it's prepared to work, right? That would mean it have the, Adam would have blood. He'd be ready to go, right? He formed man of the dust of the ground. But then what happened? And breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. So how did life come to Adam? God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Now if life equals blood, that would mean God breathed blood into his nostrils, right? Of course not. God breathed life. Why? Because life is required to make life. And then Eve, she came from the rib. Again, but from a from living organism, life was created. And from then on forward... All human life was through conception. So God did not have to breathe blood into Adam to make him live, right? He already had the blood, but he wasn't living. So blood does not equal life in that sense. What is being taught in Leviticus 17 is that blood sustains life. Okay, You need your blood because it carries the nutrients, it carries the oxygen through your body. That is what sustains someone's life. Not that it is life in of itself, but it keeps you living. Which is why it says, for the life of the flesh is the blood. Okay, Because flesh, your human flesh today needs the blood to sustain itself. Hey, but when you die and you go to heaven and you don't have a physical body just yet, are you alive? Of course you are. You're more alive than you've ever been. You're in the presence of, the God, of God, your soul, spirit, with the Lord. No blood. Does that mean you're not alive? No, you're alive. Because life, blood does not equal life. It sustains the life of the flesh. That's the teaching of this, okay? It's not saying that it's fine to terminate a pregnancy when it, that, uh, those cells still haven't, hasn't generated its own blood. Then you've got some other crazy teaching out there. And this is even more wicked than that. Is that it's not a life until the baby's born and takes its first breath. That's just crazy. Now, I, don't know if some, I think you guys know who Peter Ruckman is, an IFB pastor, independent fundamental Baptist pastor, and his followers are normally referred to as Ruckmanites. But Peter Ruckman taught this, and these are his own words. He says, I do not teach that abortion is murder, although I grant that a fundamentalist can teach that if he wants. I don't teach it for two reasons. In the first place, the clear scriptures in Genesis 2, remember what we read about Adam, as well as Job 30, 31 and Ezekiel 37. I haven't got time to go through those passages. But he says, they teach that there is no life in the human sense until there is breath. <laughs> there's no life until there's breath. Until that baby takes its first breath. So is God just waiting? I mean, I don't know if the practice, you know, I don't know if this still happens, but I think in the past when, when babies were delivered, you get a little smack on its bottom so he can cry and start breathing. Are you going to tell me God's just waiting to give that baby life? Okay, when are you going to smack that child? When are you going, oh, all right, I'll give it life now. Is that, no, that's ridiculous. I don't think that's done anymore. I think if you can just rub the baby, tickle its feet, it'll start to cry and, you know, within 30 seconds to a minute after its birth. But it's, a, <laughs> it's crazy teaching. It's crazy. And look, it's only Adam that God had to breathe the breath of life into him. Why? Because life had to make life. Right? And then life generated from there on forwards. Okay? God doesn't sit there waiting for every baby to be born to breathe its you know, breath of life into it. Okay? it. It's something specific to Adam. If you've not been made from the dust, literally in that sense, then you know, this doesn't apply to people. This applies only to Adam. That's the context of that passage. It's crazy. It's crazy. Does that mean as soon as that baby is born... You've got 30 seconds to kill it, and then that wasn't murder until it's taken its first... I mean, this is independent fundamental Baptists. And there are... Cr What's that? Sam Gipp. <laughs> that Sam Gipp, who's a Ruckmanite, taught that this idea... And he's careful with what he says. He's very sly. But he, he taught something about how Jesus was in heaven, waiting for Mary to give birth, and then as she was ready to give birth... He came in to that child, like, you know, that, at that point, when, you know, when he take, I guess when he takes his first breath. 
because he follows his idol, you know, Peter Ruckman. But he's very careful. He doesn't say it's not a lie or anything like that, but he's very careful with his teaching. But of course, that's what he's, that's what he's saying, that it's not a life until Jesus came from heaven and entered that, 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 that dead flesh, I suppose, until, you know, made it, made it live. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, all right. Go back to Jeremiah. Oh, actually, yeah, go back to Jeremiah. Jeremiah. But this time turn to chapter 19. Jeremiah 19. You might say, well, Kevin, why doesn't God speak more about abortions? Why doesn't the Bible have more about, you know, killing a baby in, its, in, in, in the womb? Well, let's read Jeremiah 19, verse 3. Jeremiah, Jeremiah 19, verse 3 says, And say, Hear ye the word of the Lord. So God's talking to Jeremiah. This is what you need to say. O kings of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring evil upon this place, the which whosoever heareth, his ears shall tingle. Why? Because they have forsaken me and have estranged this place and have burned incense in it unto other gods, whom neither they nor their fathers have known, nor the kings of his Judah, and have filled this place with the blood of innocence. With the blood of innocence. Israel was killing innocent blood at this stage. Evil upon this place, God says. Verse 5. And they built unto the high places of Baal to burn their sons with fire. Israel at this point in time were taking babies, taking children, and sacrificing them with fire, burning them alive to this false god Baal, the devil. Verse 5 again. They have built also the high places to Baal to burn their sons with fire for burnt offerings unto Baal, which I commanded not, nor spake it, neither came it into my mind. I mean, it's hard to think that God can be shocked. Doesn't God know all things? He goes, it doesn't even enter my mind. What you're doing, I can't even, I can't even think about that. I never even spoke about that. No spake and neither came it into my mind. Say, well, why doesn't the Bible have more to do? Look, it doesn't even enter God's mind. God is surprised, God is shocked that man, look, you don't need to be a believer, you don't need to be a Christian. People generally love babies, right? Generally they think it's cute, they think it's wonderful, they might not like all the noise and the dirty nappies, but they, generally speaking, you don't need to be, you just have to be a normal, sane human being, and people love babies. They think it's wonderful, right? That's why when people give birth, they congratulate. They don't say, oh, kill it. You know, they congratulate, they buy presents, they rejoice. Non-believers, sane people, normal people. Why would God expect man to do this? It doesn't even enter the mind of God. I can't even think about it. I struggle to think about this. Neither came it into my mind. These people are reprobate. Reprobate minds. They don't have a natural mind. These medical practitioners, these people that promote it, that trick women into doing this procedure. And I'm not saying the mothers are innocent. I'm not saying that. But they're being deceived. They're being deceived. Just because you're deceived doesn't mean you're innocent. Uh, Exodus 21, I'll just read it to you. Exodus 21, there is just punishment for this. Exodus 21 verse 22 says, If men strive, so if two men are fighting and hurt a woman with child, okay, two men are fighting, I don't know, the wife of one man comes to help and she gets hurt, so that her fruit depart from her, so the baby dies, and yet no mischief follow, he shall be surely punished according to the woman's husband, will lay upon him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. So if two men are fighting in a physical alteration, the woman comes and she gets, by accident, when it says there, yet no mischief follow, you know, she just gets caught in it and gets hurt, 
she loses the baby from an accident, that man still will be punished. I know it's an accident, but that man still will be punished according as the woman's husband will lay upon him and shall pay as the judge. So he's got to pay, you know, this couple. He's got to, he's got to pay for it, okay, for the death of this child. Whatever the man says is, is right and whatever the judges agree upon, that man has to pay for that life that was taken, okay? Not by death, but pay financially. Then verse 23 says this, and if any mischief follow, so now it's talking about this was purposely. Okay, two men are fighting and one of the men purposely hurts that woman. Purposely, knowing that she's pregnant, right? Purposely hurts her so that she would lose life. Okay, purposely, and that, that mischief follow, and thou shalt, look, listen to this. Then thou shalt give life for life. So that man will die because that baby died. So what's it say? Life for life. So was that baby in the womb alive? Yes. Did it have to take his first breath before it was life? No. It's a life in the womb. So if, if a man causes a woman to purposely lose life, it's life for life. And then 20, verse 24, this is a famous one. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. foot. And that's what happens in abortion clinics. It's hand for hand. They take off hands. They take out feet. They rip out the limbs of that child. Hey, that's what they deserve. They deserve to have their limbs ripped off of them. That's what the Bible says. Eye for eye. You pulled out their eye, you get your eye pulled out. Abortion doctor. You get your limbs ripped off. You die life for life. That's how God feels about it. Burning for burning, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. That's how God feels about these people that purposely end the life in a womb. Just, if you're still in Jeremiah, turn to chapter 1. Back to Jeremiah. We're, we're wrapping up. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4. I think this is the greatest sin of our nation, by the way. I think abortion is the greatest sin of our nation. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4. By the way, just let me say in Chile, I was in Chile for three months, you guys know that. And I was wondering in Chile, wow, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, and even in my own family, there are a lot of girls, single, single parents, right? Giving birth out of wedlock, you know, they, they go to university or something, fall pregnant, they're not married. And I was thinking, man, like, I mean, I'm not saying that doesn't happen in Australia, it does, but it just seemed like there was a greater percentage of women in Chile, only to find out later that they were just about to pass laws for abortion. So abor in Chile, abortion's illegal. That's why, to me, just looking at, at, at society, I could see more women, with, you know, single women with children, right? And so soon it's going to be like Australia, right? That all these babies are just going to be put to death and we're, we're going to, you know, we won't even know who these single parents are anymore, like who, who these, you know, who these whores are anymore. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 4. Then the word of the Lord came unto me saying, Before I formed thee in the belly I knew thee, and before thou camest forth in the womb I sanctified thee. And I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations... Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. My point of this passage is, we didn't read this chapter for no reason. Not only did God know Jeremiah before he was formed, not only did he sanctify him in the womb of the mother, but he ordained him to be a prophet to the nations. He ordained him to be a prophet and to proclaim boldly the word of God. My point is this, why is this nation spiraling out of control? Why is this nation wanting two men to marry, two women to marry now? Why is this nation promoting abortions and all this? I just wonder how many men of God may have been upon this earth had they not been aborted. What if Jeremiah, Jeremiah's mother said, you know what, I'm going to have an abortion. There would be no Jeremiah. This plan that God had for this life. How many pastors, how many missionaries 
How many soul winners are being put to death? And some will say, well, what's wrong with it? You know, these children go to heaven anyway. I believe they go to heaven. I believe they go to heaven. But how many people are being stopped? How many preachers that God has their plan for their, His will for their life to be great missionaries, great men of God, preaching the gospel? How many are being put to death? It impacts a nation. It impacts the nations. We need to speak out against this sin. We need to speak out against Any chance I'm going to get when I preach in the future, I'm just going to keep preaching about this. We'll keep putting it on YouTube or whatever. I don't care, whatever. It's the great sin of our nation. I want to be like Jeremiah. You know, yeah, I'm a child. I, I, you know, I'm nothing but a man. I'm nothing without the Lord. I want to speak the Lord's words. God hates abortion. God wants to kill these people, these serial murderers. That's what they are. These serial killers. God wants them dead. Now in conclusion, you might say, you know, I've had an abortion in the past. I don't know. Maybe you have. Maybe you've had a silent abortion, you've taken contraceptive pills and you know, you didn't, even, you didn't even know. I don't know. And uh, maybe you've had those side effects, the regrets and the, the shame and the suicidal thoughts. I don't know. You know, and you might say, well, Kevin, you know, this sermon just upsets me. You know, I already made mistakes. But our children need to know. For those that have not yet made these mistakes, okay, our daughters need to know, our sons need to know, okay, if you fall pregnant, hey, you should first of all get married, right? But you fall pregnant, you've got a responsibility to that life. Mums and dads, you guys, kids, when you grow up, your mums and dads, you're married, you have children, you're responsible for that life. Okay? It's a great blessing. It's a great joy to have children. We didn't, have, we didn't even cover that topic, right? The great joy it is to have children. It is. And the reason people don't find joy in it is because they don't want to be parents. They'd rather live a life where they can just do whatever they want, not be you know, restricted to being in the home with their families. And that's why they don't find joy in their, in their children. But there is great joy in having kids. Yes, there's great sorrow to give, bring them forth. But then there's great joy when you have those children, when you nurture them, when you raise them, when you love, your, your love grows. People say to me, how can you have nine kids? How can you love them all? Your heart grows. Your love grows. Your joy grows. This sermon is for the children so they don't make the same mistake that our generation made. Philippians 3 verse 13 says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. If you've made this mistake in your life, the recommendation is forgetting those things that are behind. Forget it. It's done. Confess it to God. He's forgiven you. Okay? And reach forth unto those things which are before. The high calling prize. The prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let's pray.